Good morning. Good morning. What a good morning it's been. How good was that worship? Oh, that was so sweet. So sweet. The presence of God is nothing but sweet, amen? Beautiful. Just to be, just to be postured in his love, just to know in that place of such sweetness to know that you're loved. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. To me, it's the most addictive place. The most, I'm addicted to that place. I truly am. It is my favourite place to just be washed in his love, to sit in his presence. My goodness, there's nothing like that. Nothing like it. Oh, just, man, they just get so touched. It, it just, it's, it's that inner, there's something inner that knows, that senses, that just, you, you just know that you're in the Father's embrace. Did we all experience that this morning, church? I'm glad to hear that because that, that, that is what it's all about. That's what this experience is about. This is what Father's love is about. It's for all of us. Father's love's inclusive. It includes you. It includes me. Each and every one of us, not one of us, miss out on Father's love. That's the nature of his love. Inclusiveness, all of us. Christ died on a cross that we may know that love. He made the way, declared himself the way, the truth and the life, that we might experience this life. This life is in relationship with him. Amen? Yeah. Who's enjoyed the... Uh, actually, before we get started, where's Rod? Bring him up, mate, please. Gateway, I'm going to introduce you to Sean if you don't already know him. And this young, young man's been diagnosed with cancer. And they've given him six months to live. But what, what do we believe in this house? That cancer is going to get its butt kicked. And we believe that. So we, can we believe together and pray for Sean now? And, and we want to pray together. We want to believe together because it's not the man of God that gets the glory. It's God that gets the glory. Amen. So let's pray. Extend your hands to Sean, please. Uh, another testimony in the waiting, yeah? So Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you, Lord, is, you revealed yourself as healer. And we call upon that nature. We call upon your name. We speak the name of Jesus over Sean now. We speak to you, cancer, and we say, you get off in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you die a death. Where chaos has entered into this body, we command you off. Chaos, you leave. And we release peace over this body, from head, the tip of your head, the top of your head, to the tip of your toes, we re release shalom. Body be at peace, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, yes. Amen. Amen. Bless you, mate. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you very much. Mm. That's what it's all about, church. Love for God and love for one another. Whew. And we believe, don't we? Yeah. Are we a believing church? Are we a house of believing believers? Amen. Who, who enjoyed the Mighty series? Yeah. Who took something away from the Mighty series? Who, who grew out of that? What a, good, what a good series that was. What a good series that was. And we've been praying as a pastoral team that 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 series just wouldn't be a, a four or five weeks of good church. But we've been praying that that, that that series would actually translate into a boldness and a courage to get out and to reach the lost. Amen? Because yeah. it's not just a good message of a Sunday where we leave here and we forget about it. These messages are brought, these series are brought to transform us, to empower us, to equip us. We come to church to be, to be what? Equipped in faith and good works. Amen. We do this together. 
And this is the idea of these series. And this morning we introduce a new series on the lost. So we pray that that series where we're empowered and, and we learn of the spirit of might that would, would fall upon us in reaching the lost. So that translates now into doing something. I'm getting out. We're not just tickled by a good message. As good as those messages were, those messages are meant to have impact. Those messages are meant to impact our lives in such a way that we go out and act upon them. And that's what it's all about, church. We're not seat warmers. You've heard me say this before. We are not seat warmers. We are not. We don't get saved to be comfortable. It's a promise of Jesus. Don't expect to be comfortable. I've called you to make disciples. I've called you to go out and to proclaim the good news to the who, to the broken, to the hurt, to the sick, to those that are covered in tattoos, those are riding motorbikes, those that might look a bit rough, a bit mean, a bit whatever, those who might not look or sound like you do. Go and proclaim the good news to them. We've just heard the perfect love casts out fear, so don't go, and if you feel a bit scared, go in fear anyway. Don't let that stop you. This is why we're here. This is why we're here. Not to warm a seat, not not to comfort ourselves, not to fluff our own nests up. We are signposts, church. God has always had a mission. Always a mission. To redeem that which was lost. What was it that was lost? Perfect relationship with him and each other. His mission has always been to redeem that. And now he's placed that mission in our hands. You and I. The mission of God in the hands of ordinary men. Those ordinary men are you and I. His mission. To to welcome the lost home. To bring them back into relationship with him and each other. Powerful. But... It requires something to be done. It requires us to do something. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Share the love that you've experienced. Share the love that you've come to know. Share this love that's transformed your life. Share this love that's, that's welcomed you into relationship with him and transformed in how you do relationships with others. Share it. In Jesus' name. Anybody got an amen for that? Amen. Sounds like it could get us out of the church walls, doesn't it? <laughs> and there's... The whole of heaven rejoices this week, let me tell you. There were three salvations this week. Through, through our ordinary, ordinary people doing their ordinary life. But being willing, being interruptible and being willing to stop for the one. Now what we, we fail to recognise sometimes is the rejoicing of heaven. When one sinner comes home, when one sinner repents, when one sinner returns of their ways and looks to Jesus where he stops, to, stops looking at the ways of Adam and turns to follow Jesus. The whole of heaven rejoices. And we know that the whole of heaven rejoices. It doesn't stop rejoicing. The whole of heaven continues to rejoice over you and I. As a matter of fact, the Lord rejoices over us right now. We're singing, amen. You and I, he continues to rejoice over, and this is what we share. We know this rejoicing over us. We know this value that he's placed upon us. We see it. We see it. Here he was. Put himself upon a cross as a demonstration of his love for you, that we may come back to know this love that he has for us, that we may come back to knowing the way we're supposed to do relationships with others. Amen? Let's pray. Hmm. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love that transforms. I thank you for your love that does not leave us the same. I thank you for your love that pulled us from the miry clay, Lord, pulled us from the darkness and translated us into the light. And Father, I pray that you would help us through the power of your spirit translate that 
into reaching the lost. Translate that into action, Lord. Father, where we would not sit or fall to complacency, we would not fall to apathy, Lord, but we would be stirred with such compassion where we could not look upon the one in front of us who is struggling, who is battling, and not reach out to do something. Lord, break our hearts for the lost, I ask. Break our hearts for the lost. Father, give us your heart. We, we seek after your heart for the lost, Lord. And I pray this morning there'd be revelation of what that heart looks like. Father, I pray an impartation of, of Father's heart for the lost. And I pray in the name of Jesus, amen. So this might sound a bit funny, but I've got an interesting passage of scripture I want to start in. So are you with Bibles? And I imagine that's all of you. We're going to have a, have a look in Genesis 4. The interesting passage of scripture, it's, it's an account of, of Cain and, and two exchanges he has with God. And the, the two exchanges, the first of those exchanges is, is prior to him murdering his brother. We all know the st- story of Cain and Abel. Cain gets jealous, kills his brother. Then we have an ex- the second exchange is post-murder. So here we already see the falling away of relationship. Eldest son kills his younger brother real early in the piece. But the story unfolds, as I give you an overview, we've gone a little bit long in time, so I'll just stick to an overview. So here we have Cain. So the second part of this exchange, this is post-killing of his brother. And he goes into this interesting dialogue with God and he starts speaking and he's kill, killed his brother and he comes and he says to God, I will now. Well, God says, you, you will be, he doesn't say you will be cursed, he says you are cursed. What have you done? You are cursed. Your blood speaks to me from the ground. So what I want to say in that, our sin's not hidden from God. First point. So don't think we can hide our sin from God. You might think, what's this got to do with the lost? I'll tie it in shortly, I hope. But here we are, this conversation. So God starts. So what have you done? First of all, he says, where is your brother Abel? Here's this already, we see this pattern or this tone of lostness. Where is your brother? It's similar or sounds very much like, Adam, where are you? So we're already hearing this tone very early in the piece, hearing this tone of lostness. So where's your brother? And his response, we know his response, am I my brother's keeper? He's dismissive. And God goes to say that the blood of Abel, the blood of your brother speaks to me from the ground. So we can't hide our sin. As much as Cain was trying to hide his sin, Cain had no remorse. He didn't see the error of his ways. But God knew, even the blood from the ground speaks to me of your sin. And it goes on, and it goes on as the conversation unfolds, and Cain says, oh, this punishment is too great for me, as if God had punished him for what he'd done. There is no mention in that account of God punishing him. There is no mention in that account of God bringing a curse against him. This was simply consequence of his sin. So the message in that is there's consequences to our sin. Consequence to our sin, church. So don't think you can hide your sin from God. Don't think it's hidden. Don't think he doesn't know about it. And don't think for one moment there's not consequences to those decisions we make. There's not consequences to our sin. And don't ever fall into the trap of blaming God when those consequences come upon you. It's important and we'll see why. And what I will read from is verse, we'll start from 14. So we'll read two verses. Behold, so this is after this conversation. It's a continuation of this conversation. Behold, you have driven this, driven me this day. So here he is accusing God. God hasn't driven him anywhere. His sin has separated him from God. This is a picture of what was lost. The presence, being in the presence of God and, and blaming God ever since. See, we blame God ever since. It's never been God's fault. God's never distanced himself from man. 
Man, through sin, has distanced himself from God. And this is this picture we're seeing here very early in the piece. Behold, you, so he's speaking of God, you have driven me away. You have driven me this day from the face of the ground and from your face I will be hidden. Why is he hidden? For his sin. Is it because God's turned away? No. His sin has hidden him. So there's something in when we sin that distances us from God. It's not God turning away, it's something within us. I wonder if that would be called shame and guilt even. We stand before a holy God. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. A vagrant and a wanderer. This is interesting, a vagrant. Who knows what a vagrant is? A vagrant is, a, is one without a home or employment. Or literally, one who does not belong or have purpose. Isn't that fascinating? So he declares, he, he's Cain declaring himself, blaming God all the way. He still, still won't admit to his guilt. He still won't admit to his sin. But here he is claiming to be a vagrant. One with no sense of belonging or purpose. My goodness, isn't that sad? So the Lord said to him, So the Lord then said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, because he, he goes on to say, whoever, whoever finds me will kill me. So this is his self pity. So Cain here, we see he's fallen in. There's no remorse for his sin, but he's fallen into despair and self pity. You see what's happening here? Despair and self-pity. And then the Lord says, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. So even in the midst of Cain's sin, God still valued his life. It's important. Then Cain, verse 16, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Hmm. This is where, this is where the, the, the rubber hits the ground. The land of Nod. Now many commentators refer to the land of Nod as nowhere land. Nowhere land. It's a place where you wander with no sense of belonging or purpose. This is the land of Nod. And what I'm hearing now, church, is the Lord calling us from the land of Nod. Come from the land of Nod. Leave the land of Nod, my children. I call you. Leave the land of Nod. Leave the land of where there is no sense of belonging or purpose. I call you now into a place of belonging and purpose. In Jesus' name. Now let me, here's the key. We'll go back a few verses. And what, this is the exchange prior to the murder of Abel. And this is the key to keeping us out of the land of Nod. It's important that we keep out of the land of Nod, that we may introduce uh, those who will in the, in the, land of Nod outside of the church. We can't, if we're in the land of Nod inside the church, we have no hope of welcoming those in the land of Nod outside the church into the promised land, into that place where there's belonging and purpose. So here's, here's the key. So we remember the story, the background of the story where Cain and Abel brought their sacrifices to the Lord and the Lord was, was happy or content with Abel's sacrifice, but he wasn't so pleased with Cain's. And it wasn't about, this is not about the sacrifice itself. It's about the heart condition. So it's the heart condition attached to that sacrifice that the Lord's displeased with as far as Cain, as far as Cain goes. And the Lord says to him, it says, Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now that word countenance, countenance refers to attitude. So his attitude started to fall. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? 
So why has your attitude started to wane? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So the point I want to bring this morning is our attitude. I want to remind us and have us reflect upon our attitude. What's your attitude right at this point? Is your attitude pure before the Lord? You might be about your works, you might be doing all the wonderful things, but how's your attitude? It's important because sin crouches at the door. And when we get a poor attitude, when our attitude wanes, when our countenance falls, there's sin waiting to grab hold of us. So we must master, it says you must master. So we must master our attitudes. We must keep of a good attitude to keep sin at bay so we don't end up in the land of Nod. Do you see there's something needs to be done on our behalf? This is not, oh, God, keep me from the land of Nod. God's giving uh, Cain there, as he does with us, every key that we might stay out of the land of Nod, that we might remain in the land of belonging and purpose, amen, and that we might be a shining light, we are the salt and the light of the earth, to bring others into that place of belonging and purpose. This is what this is all about. We have to know who, this is an identity thing, we must know who we are, we must know who he is before we can ever invite anyone in to, in to join us. Have you ever wondered how David could be known as a man after God's own heart? It's a question that, that's played with me from the time of my salvation. The first time I, I, I read and started to learn, learn about David as this man after God's own heart, I often wondered, uh, well, we've just spent four or five weeks largely centred around the exploits of King David. And to look at the exploits, you see, oh yeah, wonderful. But we also know David as a man of great sin. If we consider murder and adultery up there in sin, he's guilty. He's guilty, yet here he is. He's, he's, we remember him. The Bible terms him as a man after God's own heart. What is that? How is that? I believe the key is in direct contrast to Cain. His attitude. He made many mistakes, yes, but his attitude was one of contriteness. His attitude was one of repentance. He made mistakes, but he come to his God. And I believe for King David, what he learnt was to value the things that God learnt, uh, valued. And his primary value was on his relationship with God. That's why David's referred to as a man after God's own heart. He valued what God valued, and above all else, his true value was, was set in his relationship with his heavenly father, in his relationship with his God. And it needs to be the same with us, church. We've just sung about God, the one who knows us, who knows us best. He's the very one who loves us most. Warts and all. Warts and all. But I encourage us this morning to get our warts, present our warts before him, and ask for a wart removal. Maybe get Pastor Craig to pray for you. He's got an anointing there. He continues to tell us about this ward anointing. <laughs> but are you, getting, are you getting what I'm saying? So we must, and this, don't, don't hear me wrong, this is not about works. God doesn't deal with us on merit. He deals with us in grace. Amen. Never on merit. But this heart condition is so important. So important. And we look at the contrast between King David and Cain, they're poles apart. Poles apart. And our attitude, we want in alignment, we want our, our attitude in alignment with Jesus. But there, there's David, King David's a wonderful example. And him, for the mistakes, if nothing else, we should be encouraged through King David, the man of great mistakes. Now, I don't know 
I won't even go there. How many have committed adultery and murder? But we've all, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short, haven't we? So we're all in need of an attitude check. We're all in need to come to the Lord and hand him our warts. Getting a little bit late. We'll turn to, I want to turn to Luke chapter 15. We know the chapter. It's a beautiful chapter on, on the value, where we see God's value for the lost. To set this up a little bit, we look back at chapter 24, sorry, chapter 14, verse 25. Jesus starts, he's, the crowds are getting around Jesus, which we know was a common thing. But he goes on to say, to teach on the cost of discipleship. So if you want to follow me, this is the cost. So here in, in chapter 15, we have two groups of people or a series of group of people. We have notorious sinners the Bible tells us, and we have the Pharisees. So Jesus has given this teaching on, on what it costs to follow him. So here we have, in, in chapter 15, we either have the ones that have, haven't run away because Jesus' teaching scared them off. So they're there. They're dedicated to Jesus. They're the ones that have been messed up, these notorious sinners we learn. And then we have the Pharisees, the religious type, who are looking there. They're there for one reason, to catch Jesus up. So here's our two crowds and Jesus goes on to give this, to share three parables on the value of the lost. So here he has the lost on one side and he has those who have no idea that they're lost. Now I I spent most of my life thinking I was okay. I didn't realise I was lost and so was many out there that we're called to reach have no idea that they're lost. They're not purposely lost. They've been blinded to the love of God. They've been blinded to the goodness, the kindness, the mercy of God for whatever reason. Like I was, I just didn't know him. My intellect kept me away from him because I couldn't believe in, in such a profound love. That was too much for my intellect. But wasn't, once it got into my heart, it was a different story. And this is what Jesus is, is depicting here, this love of the Father that's so grand, so great that he would value even the sinner. He would value even the murderer and the adulterer. This is the love of the Father. This is his heart for the lost. So let's, let's read this together. So we have, I'll, I'll skip through to right to, he says, Jesus in, in addressing both those that are broken and hurt. So you can imagine the two sets of ears, ears how they heard this message. The religious leaders trying to catch Jesus out and those that, that they'd found someone who, who would give them the time of day. They'd actually found someone who noticed them. They found someone who would stop and eat with them, the Bible tells. Eat with them. That was a sign of great acceptance in the Middle East. Isn't that amazing? So here we go. So what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, has lost one of them? does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which was lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Who's ever seen that picture of Jesus? I think it's one of my most favourite pictures. We see it around about and he's, he's Jesus and he's got this little lamb over his shoulder. Anybody ever seen a picture like that? Mate, it could bring you to tears every time. The most beautiful picture. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbours saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is a picture of Jesus, the joy of heaven. As we just spoke about this week, heaven has rejoiced. We've seen three salvations this week. Three who were lost that are now found. Three who never knew the love of God, who now know his love. Heaven's rejoicing. But it's not only that. Here's this this interesting tension here. Jesus is addressing two groups of people. 
and he has the Pharisees there and he says, those who don't need to repent. It's a direct slap in the face to the Pharisees. They didn't realise their need of repentance. Sounds a little like Cain. See, he's addressing them, here's the lost and the rejoicing over the lost. In effect, the love of Jesus is even welcoming the Pharisees to come into this place, but they don't see he addresses their need or their lack of understanding that they need repentance also because they position themselves in a higher place. They frowned upon the sinners, the notorious sinners. They were no good. We distanced ourselves from them. There was actually a saying amongst, amongst those at that time that how heaven rejoices in the annihilation of a sinner. That's where their hearts were. I, I suggest to you that they needed an attitude check. I, I suggest to you that they were in the land of Nod. Or what woman? So here's the same message, a new parable. Same message. Or, Jesus links them. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one, loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbours, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus reinforces that, that out of that first thing. He, he, here's a funny little thing. The drachma. The coin was the drachma. Now what we learn, it's funny how Jesus uses a shepherd, a woman, and, and a re rebellious son in these three illustrations. Now these were three that the Pharisees frowned upon that the Pharisees saw as less. And here's Jesus, he uses a shepherd, a lady and a, a rebellious child. But in that, the drachma, the importance of this coin, that drachma, the women of the time would sometimes wear them around their forehead, other times around their neck as a necklace, as a sign of identity. That identified them as a married woman. So here we get to back to this importance of this identity thing. Jesus is speaking of identity. See, he's saying that that woman who, who maybe, that, that could be a symbolic of the, the, the land of Nod where she lost her identity, spent time in the land of Nod, but searched for it that hard that she found it and the whole of heaven rejoices with her. I hope we're making a bit of sense. I hope we're getting somewhere with this. The prodigal son we're all aware of the prodigal son. So this is the third parable. And this is where we really see the heart of the father. For much of the time and for, for much teaching that I've listened to anyway, there's been so much focus on the prodigal, the one that wandered. We, we've had small teaching on, on the elder son, the love of the father, even a prodigal father, the prodigal being reckless, so reckless in his love for his son. The young son being reckless in, in the way he lived, his rebelliousness. And the elder son, of course, we've had limited teaching on. Let's read together and see what Holy Spirit brings. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to this father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. That's an interesting point. He never said inheritance. And why not? Because in Middle East, when you claimed your inheritance, attached to that was responsibility. You, once you claimed your inheritance, you were then responsible for that estate. So here the youngest son, he would have known that and he claims that which is owed to him or that which falls to me. That's an interesting point when we, when in context of us coming out of the land of Nod, in context of us checking our attitude, in, in context of us recognising that us in church, us as Christians, there's something for us to do. And not many days later, the young son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. The youngest son, through his rebelliousness, had found his land of Nod. 
by choice, by willful rebellion, had landed in his place of nod. Once again, a consequence of sin. A vagabond. He'd become a vagrant. That was his place of vagrancy. And when that talks of him attaching himself to, to a Gentile, it's glued. It's the same word used in Genesis when God talks of a man gluing himself to his wife or joining himself to his wife. It's the same context. That's how close he had associated himself with this Gentile, which was highly against the way of the Jews. And it's to, to swim in the pig muck, even to desire, I'm that hungry that I would eat what the pigs are eating. My goodness, he found his land of nod. There was no belonging and no purpose there, let me assure you. And when he came to his senses, there was a shift in attitude. There, there was a desire of repentance. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father and saw him and felt, felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. We know that word compassion. I, I know we've been taught on that before. That, that's a deep well within. In the Hebrew context, that, that compassion comes from the bowel. They, the bowel they, they viewed the bowel as central to their being. And this is where this compassion comes from. There's this moving from deep, deep within towards his son. This is a picture of the love of the father as he moves always, constantly, drawing us, moving towards us. He's always moved to compassion over the lost one. Amen. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. So here's this picture of celebration again over the lost sinner. We're called to join that celebration. We're called to be a part of that celebration, church. Now, now, his older son mm, was in the field. And when, he came, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. Isn't it sad to think that he was in his father's house or on his father's property and still did not know what his father was doing? He was in his father's house. He assumed he was about his father's business even. But he had no idea what his father was doing. He was in his father's house and had no idea what his father was doing. And he said to him, your brother has come. This is a servant speaking. And your brother has come. Well, that, that messes me up to think that we could be in the father's house and not know what he's doing. We could even think we're about good works. We could even think we're about the work of God and not have any idea what he's doing. We need to be on guard against that church. He said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received, from, received him back safe and sound. But he became angry. Sounds like a similar, an eerie similarity to that exchange in Genesis between God and Cain. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. That word pleading is parakaleo. Parakaleo. And what that carries with it is a sense of closeness. You couldn't be any closer. But it also carries a sense, an implication of doing something. 
So as he pleaded with him, he's pleading with him, the father pleading with the son, come in, come in. It's a plea, it's a, he's beseeching him to do something, to come and be a part of this celebration. Come and be a part of what I am doing. That's what that is there. The parakaleo, do something. It's a call to do something and it's a close call. Holy Spirit is right beside you now, stirring you, calling you, just dropping bombs upon you right now. Right now. What are you going to do? Do something. Do something. Do something. A little too warm, a little too sore. (laughs) But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and have never neglected a command of yours. Here's all the good works. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. Here's this attitude of despair and self-pity. Woe is me, poor me. I've been about your work and you've never done anything for me. You ever been in a position, church, where you felt a bit, "Mm, someone else is getting blessed over there? Lord, I've done all the right things. I've been a good boy. Why are they getting blessed? Why are they getting blessed? I know their history. I know the mess that they've made. How could you bless them? You ever been there, church? Of course not. (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) Not this week. It's been a good morning, not this morning anyway. But when this son of yours came who has devoured, so here's the son making accusation now. Here's this, I know the mess he's made. Devoured your wealth with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother. This brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. His father's heart. His father's heart for the lost. We must rejoice. There is such value, church, upon you, upon me, and the same value, Christ died for all, died once for all. And the value he's placed upon you, he has the same value for those out there that are yet to meet him. And he has called us into his mission. We are the signposts that guide the lost back to Christ. You and I have a job. You and I have a commission to do something. Go and make disciples. Go and proclaim the good news. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. That should be enough to excite you to think that we could raise the sick and uh, raise the dead and heal the sick. Amen. That should be enough to get us off our butts. We're going to, Terry, we'll put on that clip now. We're we're, We're just about done. I want us to watch this clip. I believe this could stir us. I believe Andy Stanley in three minutes can probably overview what I've just taken 35 minutes to do. It's the fact that they're so overwhelmed. It is overwhelming to think about. It's overwhelming for us to think about. He says, but I'll make you a promise. 
If you do this, surely I am with you always to the very end of this current age. But here's the question, who is you? Are you you? Am I you? Are you you? Do, do you know who you is? You is believers whose belief has feet. You is believers who understand we're partnering with our King. You are the disciple makers. Do you, I know the answer is kind of rhetorical, but do you want Jesus to be with you? That according to Jesus, you have to be with him because he is a way bigger deal than you. And he is a way bigger deal than me. And his agenda is a way bigger agenda and a way more important agenda than my personal agenda. Do you want Jesus to be with you? Then you have to choose to be with him. Are you with him on this? It is, to make a specific, is, is any of your time are, are, are any of your resources already ahead of time allocated? That is part of the rhythm of your life, predecided, carved out. Is any of your time, are any of your resources allocated to making more followers of Jesus? Does any of your money or your time intersect systematically? with the endeavors of a local church or an organization somewhere to make more disciples. In other words, do your resources and your time, does it intersect systematically with the mission of your king? Are you engaged, am I engaged in our king's business? Or are we too caught up minding our own? Wow. Wow. So, and what it took me 35 minutes to do, Andy Stanley's just summed up in three. But there's the crux of the message. Isn't that a beautiful, isn't that challenging? Isn't it? It's a little challenging, but it's also comforting and encouraging to think Jesus promised to be with us always. He's not sending us out on our own, he's with us all the way. So I'll, this morning, for ministry time, we're going to do this a little different, differently this morning. I want you to just sit for, for one moment and contemplate. What has God just said to you? And then secondly, what are you going to do about it? So over the past three quarters of an hour, what has God said to you? And then what are you prepared to do about it? So this morning, church, rather than invite us to the front, I want us just to those around you, just gather in, a, in small groups and we're just going to take a couple of minutes to pray over each other. As we do that, if there's any of you that haven't entered in to this, God, uh, this love of the Father, if nobody of you experienced the love of the Father, if you've never experienced His embrace, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I invite you now. Just put your hand up if, that, if there's anyone here who hasn't, hasn't committed their life to Jesus, hasn't made a decision to follow him. Okay, we'll pray with you. Okay, church, gather into small groups and just for a couple of minutes we'll pray over each other.
Beautiful church. Beautiful. So if there's anyone wants any, any further prayer, we'll have a ministry team at the front here, so feel free, feel free to come forward. And bless you all, Gateway Church. Bless you all as disciple makers. Amen.